So recently I got a subscriber, Aphos, Iphos, it uh, doesn't matter. They're a Dark Moon Blade like me. I also have the Covenant Ring. I, I tried to propose to my ex-boyfriend with it, but uh... They pointed out that Quayla, God of Dreams, is actually Nera or some such in the OG Japanese. Thus, my lore on it is Swiss cheese, full of holes. And also great with corned beef. Not that it matters, I'm certainly not hurt or embarrassed. This lore channel is like game theory. Matt Pat doesn't always believe the theories he puts out there, like why Mario is mental, one of my favorites. Go watch it, it's lovely. But mostly he just wants to make you think and teach you things through edutainment. For me, I just want to share ideas in a similar vein. So even if something I put out there is certifiably wrong, it hardly matters, as long as it got those gears turning. Like another recent subscriber. I like this guy. See, this person sums up my saying that there are two kinds of Dark Souls players. Ones who get the Iron Golem armor and go, yeah, okay, good stuff. And ones who get it and go, how does this fit me? I need answers! Because those people are weird, and I like weird. As, like, more than a friend. <clears throat> so I want to discuss some of my favorite debunked lore and some generally odd lore ideas I've come across that I really like. So let's get down to it. Number one, Aldia is the dragon in the shrine. This one is debunked and hard. I'm glad they added Aldia proper to the DLC since I think Aldia is my favorite thing in these games. I mean, I love the Children of Dark, but a lot of that stems from my own expanded lore of them. But with Aldia, the love is entirely based on what the game did with him. This scholar who gained ultimate knowledge, more or less, and in doing so, lost hope. But you have to admit, if they hadn't added him to the game, we'd probably for the most part be buying into this dragon theory, because it makes a lot of sense, and it's actually pretty cool. Number two, Solaire is the Firstborn. I guess technically this isn't outright debunked, but for all intents and purposes, it seems the Nameless King is the Firstborn. This is a piece of lore I never got to enjoy because I started playing the games long after they were a thing. So I didn't get to experience them as part of a community like a lot of people did. I might have bought into this back in the day had I gone in blind. Solaire even drops some hints that he could be, he does refer to the sun as being like a father, and you could easily interpret his quest for the sun as being a quest for redemption. But that's the whole point. People read into it as they saw fit. Number three, Mytha is Gwendolyn. Most of you probably ain't heard this one. I myself stumbled upon it by accident years ago while reading fanfiction. In fact, I think I might have been reading Smut. I, I, there's a good chance. Someone points out Mytha's neck piece resembles the points on Gwendolyn's golden adornment, and her snaky form can kind of be related back to Gwendolyn. He has snakes for legs. Gwendolyn was also raised as a daughter, and I get the impression that they were never seen as good enough, always in the shadow of their greater siblings, so... Mytha's obsession with beauty and perfecting herself could be a path Gwendolyn took. Mostly I like this idea because it's weird. Yes, think outside the box. In my case, the Xbox. Any DS2 footage I get is, is still from the 360 version. Mundane fact. Number four, the identity of the unkindled one. This is more of an all-encompassing piece of lore or concept. See. Evidently, there is a subset of Dark Souls players who fundamentally misunderstand this series. MatPat of Game Theory even did a video about the identity of the character in Dark Souls 3. With MatPat, I always look at that as his headcanon, passed off as a Game Theory since it's called Game Theory, not who my Dark Souls character is theory. And he puts it out there that the Unkindled One might be the third Black Hand of Lothric. Along with Black Hand Gotard and Black Hand Kamui? Kamui? Whatever. The lore he delves into to support the idea is flimsy. He misses a few things, but as headcanon goes, it works pretty well. 
But if you look into this, good lord some people come up with the weirdest stuff. What if the unkindled one is Ocelot? Wh what? What are you even basing that on? Even my most flimsy lore is based on something. Again, do you get that since we can summon people explicitly from other worlds, that this is basically, and I guess literally, a many worlds interpretation on some level? Maybe in game everything follows a similar path. Maybe it's all the same up to the starting point of Dark Souls 1, but you get to decide who and what your character is, what they do, and in that sense, you can even say who lives and dies if it's possible to justify it in the reality of the Dark Souls world. So timelines from there branch off. For example, a paragon will probably leave Priscilla alone. An asshole character, only out for themselves, might decide this chick is otherworldly. Think of the soul she must have. And yet another kind of character might be legitimately forlorn and welcomed by Priscilla, saying F this fire nonsense, I'm staying here to cuddle best giant girl. All of these possibilities occur just split across different iterations of the world. It's not hard to understand. Is it? Am I the outlier here with this theoretical physics crap? Some people save Solaire from the Sunlight Maggot. Others don't. And yet others just kill him at some point in the game because they want his armor. All of these things occur in some timeline. And number five. Nadalia linked the fire. This one, I, I don't know, man. I, I'm not one to punch down on anybody's theory. I like to think any theory is valid if it's possible and if it makes you think interesting thoughts. But this one is, like, kind of disproven by itself. So anyway, Nadalia's ashen remains can be found at the bottom of Broom Tower with the crown of the old Iron King. It's clearly a big-ass kiln she's sitting in, maybe not literally, and since there is some kind of throne here, I actually see it as probably the earliest construction point in regards to the tower, and a temporary throne for the Iron King inside of what is aesthetically a kiln, because, I mean, the guy was obsessed with fire and iron. Now, some posit that Nadalia was actually a good girl, and ended up linking the fire for... some reason. To be fair, the theory puts it forth that when she says, My dear sisters will come... <laughs> and something something, I require your strength and ear that these words imply she is afraid of their arrival and needs strong allies. I, of course, vote in the negative. I always interpreted that line as a threat, and her requiring your strength or whatever is actually her still referring to her sisters. That or the confused ravings of a madwoman. I mean, she does seem to mistake you for the old Iron King and talks about the two of you like you're some long-separated couple. That said, if she linked the fire, why does she clearly state she has a champion of dark? And follows it up with the inference that we have already lost. I guess this can't be disproven per se, but everything about this points to it being... WRONG. <laughs> yeah, even metagaming, we have Alsana, the one who turned good. Why repeat that trope with two of the children of dark? But what do y'all think? Is there any debunked or weird yet-to-be-proven lore you really like? If so, do tell. No, really, I I'd like to know. This series means so much to me. I never tire of blathering on about it with all and sundry. So, put it down in the comments below. Remember to like and subscribe and ring that bell of awakening icon. Somebody else has to say that. I'm probably, like, probably involuntarily plagiarizing somebody with that comment. <laughs>